Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome everybody to this webinar on Christianity and Ethical Struggle on behalf of the University of St. Andrews Anthropology Society. We have four amazing speakers with us today for what promises to be a scintillating discussion. My name is Benjamin, and I'm honored to be one of your co-moderators for this webinar alongside my colleague, Destiny. Before we begin, some housekeeping. I would like to let everyone know that this webinar will be recorded and put on our YouTube channel shortly after the conclusion of the event. Live captions can be turned on by clicking the three dots um, uh, on the top right corner of the screen and pressing the turn on live captions button if you're on my, the desktop version of Microsoft Teams. And in the mobile version, the three dots will be on the bottom of the screen near the end call button. Um, unfortunately, um, live captions are not available at this time uh, for those on the web app. Um, but if there are any um, additional accessibility concerns, please contact us through our email or social media. Um, this webinar will begin with opening statements from our speakers um, before transitioning into a Q&A session. Please post your questions um, in the chat or virtually raise your hand um, and we will call on you um, like as the webinar goes on. Um, without further ado, I'll hand the proverbial microphone to our first speaker, Dr. John Blesky. Thank you. John? Uh, yeah, sorry, I just want to start my stopwatch here so I don't prattle on too long. Okay, well, I'd like to go and start out by thanking the University of St. Andrews Anthropology Society Committee and specifically uh, Benjamin, Dayun, and Destiny for organizing this. It's a pleasure to be here today, not only because I have a lot of affection for St. Andrews, but because these are probably some of my three favorite anthropologists that I get to be alongside. Now, the anthropology of Christianity and the anthropology of ethics has been deeply interlinked, not just in the sort of um, accidents of when they occurred as intellectual movements, but in their substance of subject matter. Um, it's, again, no accident that a lot of the anthropology of ethics has been centered on accounts of self-work that's been drawn with relatively different degrees of directness um, from uh, the last two volumes of Foucault's work of self-fashioning. And this is work which, why, of course, based on um, uh, antiquities, it has a Christian telos in as much as that uh, Foucault was trying to go and explain uh, the Christian roots of uh, the modern epoch. Um, now, this has left the uh, person not just as the chief agent of ethical transformation, but as the object of ethical transformation as well, in as much as Foucault centered on uh, the importance of self-work. Um, and this is arguably even the case with uh, variants of the anthropology of ethics that uh, don't claim any direct lineage to Foucault, but still end up looking pretty much isomorphic with it. I'm thinking here of a lot of the Aristotelian uh, versions of, the, of uh, the anthropology of ethics. And this has especially been the case in discussions of Protestant and post-Protestant groups, which the anthropology of Christianity has pretty much focused on. But there are examples, moments, um, where there are disconnections between moral agency and moral patiency, where what is at stake is not self-transformation, but a duty to some other people and sometimes even to non-human others. I'm thinking specifically here um, in the non-anthropology of Christianity work of um, Adam Reed on uh, animal ethical campaigning for animal welfare. Now, I bring all this up uh, by way of introducing my discussion of Mormonism and Mormon transhumanism. Now, Mormonism is, or rather the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, as they uh, would prefer to be officially known, at least according to the institutional church, is an outgrowth of and the demographic center of a mode of religiosity was founded in 19th century America by Joseph Smith, the American prophet. Uh, it's got a lot of distinctives, including um, numerous other additional sacred texts that supplement the Bible, um, but it's also known for the practice of celestial marriage or polygamy, which was rejected as something done on earth around the 1890s to early 1910s, though it's still possible as an option in the afterlife. It's also known for theosis, that is, the um, 
doctrine that one can become a god. And this is important because there was a historical link between uh, celestial marriage and theosis. So Mormonism as a ethical practice uh, has a lot of sort of like disciplinary aspects and I'm looking really familiar to people who studied uh, ethical formations and other forms of Christianity. But because of the practice of sealing, that is of making various familial and um, marital ties, uh, not just for time, as you say, but for eternity, that is going and having the family unit uh, continue on into the afterworld. Um, this means that there's an ethical duty to a larger collectivity as well. And furthermore, this is an ethical duty to a collectivity which is always expanding because um, as you are sealed to people and they are sealed to people and they're sealed to people, the horizon for who you are connected to extends um, and perhaps in their aspirations to all of humanity because there is the hope through various practices such as baptism for the dead to go and have all of humanity, at least in a post-mortal state, be Mormon. Now, this means that you have an ethical duty to a larger collectivity that far exceeds the self, uh, and also that this is an ethical collectivity that's laminated into cosmological time, because things you do not only affect what will happen in the universe after your death, as you and your kin ascend to godhood and start making worlds and even universes of your own, but there is sort of ethical acts that can occur in the future that uh, you have some responsibility for now. So that's a lamination of basically Christian time and Christian ethics to sort of a cosmological scale. Now, I'm going to be quick here because I realize I've exceeded my five minutes, but Mormonism contemporarily is in crisis. Uh, a lot of the early practices of the church were invisible to its members because the church controlled uh, its narrative about its history. But with the advent of the internet, you can find out all sorts of things about the church that the church institutionally would rather not have you know. Things like uh, Joseph Smith's polygamy, uh, problematic issues about race that characterize the church, a history of violence, some, um, how should I say, uh, questions about the historicity of the Book of Mormon, an account of Hebrew settlers in the New World. Um, but this has actually been an opportunity because at the same moment, there has been a Mormon transhumanist movement. Now, Mormon transhumanism has taken examples of things like miracles as technology, theosis as being something that's engaged in work and important agency to go and speculate that the means through which all these changes are supposed to occur is not through just divine fiat or supernatural action, but through technological means using uh, various near future uh, technologies to go and basically physically transform the self to have the capacity of gods using things like genetic engineering, nanobots, artificial intelligence, etc. Um, there's a lot of interesting things about Mormon transhumanism and why Mormon transhumanism allows for people to be Mormons in good standing and avoid some of the ethical quandaries that's been raised by knowledge of the history of the church. But the chief thing I want to point out, at least as far as ethics go, is that this is a further turn in the way ethical duty is structured because one not only has ethical duty to an ever expanding network of kin and co-believers, but in as much as this kind of theosis and cosmological transformation is something that's achieved through technology, you now have responsibility, not just for individuals, but for actually the unfolding of cosmological time itself. And furthermore, because this is a collective project, the idea of it being done individually recedes in as much as the ethical duty as far as Mormon transhumanism, qua Mormon transhumanism stands, the individual responsibility and responsibility for self-work recedes. That doesn't mean, of course, that they don't engage in self-work and they don't care for their immediate family, 
But that's seen as being more of a kind of conventional Mormon practice. And I just wanted to go and start out with this. This duty not to just a collectivity, but to cosmological time itself to suggest that there might be a lot more liability in play and openness in the account of the relationship between Christian time and Christian ethics than one might think from just sort of being familiar with the literature as it is to date. And I'm hoping that one of the things that we can do is to really expand and explore this space. Anyhow, I've, I've gone on for far too long. I want to thank you for my patience and letting me carry out like this. Well, thank you so much, John. Um, Dr. Maya Mabelin, um, I guess um, <clears throat> if you can go next. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you, Destiny. And the organizers, um, the society for having us here. It's, I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, and I just want to just check before I start the format, I was a little bit, my interpretation was that I was going to introduce myself um, very briefly and then later on talk about my response to your question about Christian temporalities. Um, John seems to have done it kind of all in one go. So what would you prefer? I can, I can do either way. No, um, um, introduce yourself and your work first. I think that's the um, main thing. OK, and then talk about my the question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm sure I was going to yeah, do later. exactly what John did, probably also overrunning like John did. <laughs> <laughs> Full disclosure. We, we, we will pose we will pose the question um, again, like um, at, at the um, end. Um, if you if John and Richard, if you want to add more things to it, that's OK. But um, if you would like to just introduce your work um, for now, that's okay. also good. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So that so so that that'll make for for a you know a very I, I really won't probably take up much time um, making up for John running over. So um, so I'm Maya Mablin. Um, I call myself an anthropologist. Um, and when people prompt me for further details, I like to say that I study both religion and religiosity. Um, because I see my interests as spanning, you know, not only um, institutional forms of religion, but non-institutionalized um, forms of practice as well. Um, and in some ways, you could say what interests me most are the exchanges and transitions between those two states. Um, on another level, I'd say that I have um, an enduring interest in sort of life's creative vitality, and that's why I, I'm in the area we call religion. Um, and this is something I've been having to think about a lot recently um, for work I've been doing on um, <clears throat> a special an edited collection for um, Andreas Bandak and Simon Coleman on um, the, the, the category of religion and where we were all prompted to think about um, our own work trajectory in relation to the, the troubled category that is religion in anthropology um, and then how we got there. And in reflecting on this, I, I came to the, the sort of slightly bizarre conclusion that um, I see doing anthropology as in some ways a mode of religiosity in the sense of pursuing vitality. But I like to make a distinction between that and, and the fact that what I do as an anthropologist is gather data not on vitality itself, but the, the condensation of that vitality into sort of always particular um, and constrained forms or what we might call religion um, <clears throat> in, in some ways. So um, my work is on Brazil and over the mainly in Brazil um, over the past few years, I've also been working in Scotland and Britain more generally. Um, in Brazil, my interests cross cut or intersect with theology, gender, sexuality, politics, morality. I mean, the list goes on. I always find it very hard to contain myself. Um, which is why it's so useful when other people define you. You know, you can say, oh, that's what I am. You know, that's what I'm doing. Um, Brazil has, of course, famously been described as the largest Catholic nation in the world. Um, I think this moniker might be changing in the current day with the sort of onslaught of rise of, you know, Protestant evangelical forms um, of religiosity. But anyway, I'm, I'm currently putting the finishing touches to um, a long suffering monograph on political priests, um, Catholic priests who become politicians. Um, and more recently, I've been working, um, I've been very interested in ritual, and in particular in secular forms of ritual in Britain, which seek to mimic or in some way reproduce the kinds of form that have long been the preserve of religious institutions. 
Um, and in this vein of research, I found myself working on two interconnected projects. Um, one is um, on um, <clears throat> with an artist photographer called Miranda Hutton. We've been exploring everyday aesthetics um, of mourning among, among people who profess no faith. So people who are not necessarily, wouldn't necessarily describe themselves as atheists, but just as nons, if you like. Um, and, as, and, as, and a sort of adjacent project has been looking at public health funerals. Um, so basically, you know, asking the question, what what kinds of material practice and ritual justifications um, take effect when council officers, um, municipal council officers are left to dispose of dead bodies in the absence of any established guidelines or knowledge about the deceased quite often. So this more recent work on secular death is, I think, um, what I will, I'm going to talk more about in response to the question you are posing today. I'll stop there. Thank you, Maya. Um, I think we can um, transition to um, um, Dr. Joel Robbins. Hi, well, thank you very much. Uh, and thanks to Benjamin and Diwan and Destiny for having me here and for placing me in such great company. Um, I don't know how everybody else's teams displays, but mine looks like a drafts and knots or what in America we call tic-tac-toe grid. And 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 until just a moment ago, I, I kind of had a winning uh, a winning row of um, of uh, Maya, John, and and Richard. So that that was very nice. I I appreciate the question very much, and I appreciate the company uh, that you've assembled. So uh, thinking in terms of five minutes, which I may overrun, but I'm going to try not to. I thought there's a time only for one argument. So rather than talk about all the all the things that I I I could be interested in related to this topic, I thought I would just present an argument I played with recently in a in a paper that's that's very much uh, unsettled. It, it was for like a working paper volume, and I kind of surprised myself by getting to this argument. But I think it's relevant to the question of Christian temporality and time. So uh, let me just lay this out. It's one idea meant to be provocative, but very happy in conversation to talk about this or anything else. Um, and because of the venue I originally developed this idea for, it starts with what's known as the axial age hypothesis, which is a, a kind of macro argument that's often framed in historical terms. And in fact, it's so macro, it doesn't have a whole lot of uptake in, in anthropology, um, and for reasons that will probably be clear in a minute. The gist then of the Axial Age argument is that between the 8th and the 3rd centuries before the Common Era, a set of similar transformations occurred in the religions and philosophies of, and this is the common list, ancient Israel, ancient Greece, early imperial China, and the Hindu and Buddhist civilizations. And in this, in this, in for people who are interested in this discourse, mostly historians and, and sociologists, it's often added that Christianity and Islam, though coming later than this period of the 8th to the 3rd century, have their roots sunk deep in these kinds of axial age traditions. So what makes a, um, what makes a, what is an axial transition is the idea that 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 the religions and philosophies in these places during this time moved to what scholars have called an age of criticism or an age of transcendence. And the basic point here is that during this time and in these places, people stopped taking their everyday worlds for granted and began to criticize them from points of view outside of or beyond them. So rather than simply working through daily life, people began to imagine how that life appeared from some vantage point that was outside or above them. Axial religions, then, are ones that posit a world more mo morally perfect than this one, a world with a deity or deities that are not like, like people with all their weaknesses. If you think about how ancestors are often portrayed, they, they often have kind of, you know, human emotional vicissitudes and human pettiness and things like that. The axial religions imagine deities that aren't like people in these ways, but are instead morally perfect and set an ideal of the lives that people should aspire to. Now, I'm not interested in this historical argument, which I think clearly is, um, you know, it's it's just too big and 
and too typologizing for um, it, it, it makes too much of a claim for anthropologists. But I would like to follow some soci sociologists, particularly Shmuel Eisenstadt, in turning it into an argument instead about ideal about an ideal typical distinction between two types of societies. That is to make the argument the axial argument or to turn the axial age argument into instead into an argument that societies that posit a kind of perfect transcendent world are really different in the way their social processes work out than societies that don't. And this is what has been important to me because I think Europman went from living in a world that didn't posit a society, uh, a, a world that was more perfect than their own to one that did with their Christian conversion. Now, what's relevant about all this today is I wanna suggest that what I'm gonna call, there is no good term for this, but within the axial age discourse, they're called non-axial societies. So those are the ones that are all committed to imminence. Um, I wanna suggest that these two kinds of societies, the non-axial and axial ones, foreground different kinds of moralities with different relationships to time. To put it in a nutshell, and as I've said, to be provocative, we could say in societies that don't focus on a transcendent, more perfect world, morality is largely socially pragmatic and devoted to getting past short-term social difficulties. It's about keeping social life moving in the present, about maintaining perhaps what Maya means by vitality, okay? In axial traditions, on the other hand, Morality becomes much more about the self rather than about social relations. And this is why social withdrawal can be a moral accomplishment in these kinds of religions. Um, it's also oriented, I think, to the long term, toward becoming and being a certain kind of person who lives a certain kind of life over the long run, rather than just moment to moment decision making. Uh, John spoke of cosmological time, and we might say this eth these axial ethics situate themselves in something like cosmological time, which is also marked by people who participate in these religions taking a view toward their status in eternity, which I don't think in non-axial religions is, is so much of a concern. To put these in terms, and I'm almost done here, to put these in terms, that echo those used in economic anthropology, um, we might say that non-transcendent ethics are embedded. They answer to social demands and serve social ends in social time, the time of what used to be called social dramas and developmental cycles. And I don't know if these, these phrases still, still echo. I think my, my fellow panelists will know them in any case, but they're geared toward a kind of a time that's meaningful in social relational terms. By contrast, we could say, again, borrowing from the economic anthropology distinction, axial ethics could be seen as disembedded. They answer to their own ideal logic, regardless of the social consequences that unfold in social time. And they therefore, therefore work themselves out on a timeline that's not identical to the main ones that govern social life. There's something in all this of Bernard Williams's distinction between ethics and morality that's been brought into the anthropology of ethics um, by James Laidlaw, but particularly by Webb Keen. You might, you might, if you know that, I probably don't have time to review that distinction here, but it's a lot like what I'm talking about. Ethics is a kinds of, of rules of thumb for getting by in an honorable way. Morality are theoretical systems of what perfect behavior would be like. Um, Williams doesn't relate them to time the way I have. So that's probably given our theme. What's new here is the idea that embedded ethics or what Williams called ethics has a temporality that is quite different than disembedded ethics or what I'm calling morality. To close, I'll just remind you that I said axial and non-axial societies tend to foreground one or another of these moralities. I didn't say that either kind of ideal typical society wouldn't recognize the kind of morality it doesn't foreground. I doubt any society gets by without some kind of embedded morality. And I think it's worth looking at least for intimations of disembedded ones, even in non-axial societies. But 
I do think, given our question today about Christianity, that in many Christian societies, certainly not all, this kind of disembedded morality has a kind of foreground quality, and that relates you to time differently than an embedded one. Thanks. Thank you so much, Joel. Um, um, without further ado, I guess Richard. Dr. Richard Irvine. Hello, thank you. Um, first of all, um, I, if there's any problems with this connection, um, I apologize to my fellow speakers, but all of the, you who are students at St. Andrews already know that our internet connection here has some issues. Um, they're well, well recognized issues, but um, yeah, but I am in my office, so it's the university's, uh, it's the university's internet that I, I will blame. Um, uh, the other thing um, that I want to apologize for is in case anybody here, I think there are one or two people potentially who are having to hear me for the second time today. I'm sorry, that's that's too much, <laughs> too much too soon. Um, okay, I'm going to be more um, imminent, I think, uh, in how, um, how I talk about time here. I'm going to think about time in the context of lockdown. Um, and so my original, my PhD work was with uh, Catholic monks, English Benedictine monks. Um, and during the lockdown, in the context of the pandemic, I sort of took the opportunity um, to, to catch up with them um, and just see, see how everyone was. Um, and I wrote to uh, one of my friends in the monastery, Father David, who now teaches um, teaches philosophy at San Anselmo, which is the, the Benedictine training college in Rome, basically. Um, and of course, if, as you may remember, Italy was sort of the first place that was kind of hit in, in Europe by the uh, by the pandemic. And so they were kind of riding riding that wave before it um, before it affected the rest of us. Um, and he described these kind of shifts of emotion as, as the pandemic sort of swept through um, and then suddenly hitting this brick wall of, of lockdown and he says now inevitably it has begun to shift to a kind of stale boredom Cassian of course had just the word for it acedia yesterday I just went to the end of the drive simply to look outside and enjoy really enjoy the sight of the wisteria in the road that is the real pity to miss the spring colors and smells so what was quite interesting about what Father David was doing here was the way that he was reaching into monastic history um, to this idea that I'll go into here of Acedia to kind of to, to give voice to, to describe something which had actually become a very commonplace experience for all of us, um, not just for monks. So the person he was alluding to there, um, John Cassian, um, born around 360 AD, and he compiled the teachings of all of these um, desert monks, so uh, people who sort of went for a life of, of solitude um, in the Nile Delta and then found out everyone else had gone for a life of solitude in the Nile Delta, and so they were all having arguments and all kinds of things with one another um, in, in their glorious solitude. Um, but he, so Cassian compiles all of these, all of these teachings, and he describes this dejection that's felt, um, this dejection and despondency that's felt by the desert monks, which um, was given the name Acedia, or um, it's a, a Greek term, so it's probably better Acedia, um, and it, it means literally lack of care, that they sort of stopped caring about stuff because things were so boring. Um, and one of the things that um, this was associated with, because of course the monks pray the psalms during, you know, they pray the psalms as they still do in monasteries today, was Psalm 91 or 90, depending on how you, you cut the cake of the book of Psalms, which refers to the scourge that lays waste at noon. Um, what's, what, what is it about noon which is kind of particular? Well, noon is when the sun hangs in the, in the middle of the sky and it's, it's, it's just stuck there. You know, morning, you're seeing the sun rising, evening, you're seeing the sun setting, you, you go to bed, those kind of structure time. But noon is this really awful sense of stuckness because the sun is just up there. And you're like, when, when, you know, is, is anything going to happen today? You know, and, and he um, 
and so one of the the monks who inspired uh, who inspired Cassian, um, Vagrius Ponticus, um, he describes this sensation in this way. He says um, that Acedia first makes the sun appear to slow down or stop, so the say, day seems to be fifty hours long. Then it forces the monk to keep looking out of his window and rush from his cell to observe the sun in order to see how much longer it is to the ninth hour and to look about in case any of the brothers are there. Then it assails him with hatred of his place, his way of life and the work of his hands. So in this sense of stuckness, of time just not seeming to go anywhere, there's this sense of, of um, boredom, of torpor, which Leaves, leaves the monk exhausted to the point of just not caring, leaves him looking for any distraction out there, um, restless, wanting to just run away from this. And there's this kind of double movement of acedia, right, which I think is really striking. It's this sense of, you know, on the one hand, not wanting anything, and on the other hand, wanting anything but this. Um, and I think if, if um, I think that that was sort of a very, very common experience for so many people during lockdown. What was so striking about it was that the, the monks were really speaking from this place of experience and tradition within, uh, within monastic history, which had suddenly become very contemporary in the context of everybody who's stuck with this, this noonday demon. I'll give another quotation um, from Vagrius, which should be very apt for academics, and I challenge any academic to have not had this exact experience. Um, so Evagrius writes, um, when he reads, the monk afflicted with the sedia yawns a lot and readily drifts off into a sleep. He rubs his eyes and stretches his arms. Turning his eyes away from the book, he stares at the wall and again goes back to reading for a while. Leafing through the pages, he looks curiously for the end of texts. He counts the folios and calculates the number of gatherings. So. I think I think everybody has been stuck with a book and been so bored that they've started to flick through the pages. You know, this is and it's that sense of stuckness and boredom which the desert monks are speaking speaking from. Um, now, there's a couple of things I'm going to pick up on this. I don't want to. I can't go into too much detail right now. But the first is that we're talking about struggle here, right? And the first is that even within um, the Vagrius um, and the way that this then becomes formalized, this idea of acedia becomes formalized by Cassian. There's a shift in the nature of the struggle. Uh, Vagrius talks about acedia as a demon, that boredom is literally a demon which grabs hold of you. Um, whereas Cassian talks about it as a sin. And so there's this sense of a shift from something which is a struggle with the force which is out with um, the monk to something which is a struggle within. But in general, what Acedia does is it defies the neat idea of the autonomous agent, which is often um, which offers often figures in secular modes of ethics, I suppose, because context, self, and the agency of evil, and evil here has an agency, that's why it's, it's, it's thought of as a demon, are all part of this, this complex, which is, um, which is the sin of Acedia. And so in lockdown, monks found themselves speaking to this world, suddenly having to take on the distancing and self-isolation of the monk. Um, and obviously they're, they're thinking, well, we're in this unique situation where suddenly our advice is of some kind of, of use here. Um, and recognizing the ease with which boredom becomes, um, with which boredom turns to despondency, um, Come, it becomes a battleground then, and it's a battleground where we need to fight against, and this is quoting another one of the monks, uh, Father Michael, fighting against giving the evil one the opportunity to dominate our lives, placing us in a state of bondage. And he gave various examples of this, you know, the, the bitterness of memories that the devil uh, freshens in our minds, because we've got nothing else to do. So we start going through all of these things, you know, who's who's bugged us in the past? Um, this, this, this is one that... that I'm particularly guilty of um, the um, and just the restlessness, you know, any, anything but this. And it's that restlessness that would lead us to, you know, vices like gambling or um, vices like porn. And so left to our own devices, such a struggle is 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 deeply hard. How how can we do we have the resources in this contemporary world to deal with boredom? So finally, what I'll do is I'll end by thinking about what the, this um, monastic tradition thinks of 
in terms of the remedies for acedia. Um, so in the Vagrius and, and Cassian, there are three remedies for acedia, for this stockness, which I think we're all, um, which, which we, we're all now familiar with. The first is perseverance. Now this is, this is you know, it's, it's, a, it's an annoying thing to say as a remedy. You know, you're bored, well just, you know, just stick with it, stick with it, that's fine. Um, but in, in the evolution of monasticism, of course, this idea of perseverance becomes part of the way in which monks structure their lives. The idea of the vow of stability, which became an important feature of Benedictine monasticism, kind of fights against this idea to take flight, to, to just do whatever, you know, to, to, to just get wherever you can. And instead says, no, you commit yourself to a particular place. But crucially, that's a social stability. You commit yourself to a particular place with the others around you. It's, it's a form of family life, in other words. And of course, we have to ask, well, you know, in, in, in the anomic situation we find ourselves in, is there the condition for that kind of stability? How can any of us have stability when we have to bounce about taking whatever job, you know, not knowing whether we're going to be able to afford the rent in a particular place, let alone having a network of people that we can we can have that stability with. The other, the second remedy for acedia, and Cassian was particularly keen on this, is work, and in particular, manual work. Um, so, and I think that's very important because it talks about the embodied nature of this struggle. This is not just a struggle of the mind, and spiritual life is not just this retreating into the mind, but there's always this idea that we need to take, we need to recognize that we are embodied creatures, um, and that manual work is sort of is, is a way of doing this. Um, in the Rule of St. Benedict, um, chapter 48, it talks about idleness being the enemy of the soul in this sense. Um, and the final remedy, uh, says Evagrius, um, is, is quite simply tears. Um, so Evagrius writes, sadness is burdensome and acedia is irresistible, but tears shed before God are stronger than both. So in place of carelessness, this recognition of pain, and in place of isolation, a sharing of pain. So I will leave it there. Um, and I've also gone way over the five minutes. Apologies for that too. Okay. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, I think um, I'll, I'll hand the microphone to um, Destiny as well to introduce the central question um, for um, which all the speakers have touched upon. <laughs> um, in, in their in their opening statements, but um, we'll pose the central question and um, give Maya a chance to respond to it as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone. It's fantastic getting to hear from some of you already. And now let me pull up that central question. I'm so sorry. I had it just here and then I just lost it. Okay, here we go. And our central question for tonight is, how does Christianity interact with contemporary ethical struggles by shaping people's experiences and imaginations of time? So this will be kind of just whoever wants to speak up, go ahead and speak up. And for our audience, Feel free to pop all your questions in the chat. If you'd like to raise your hand, um, please do so and we will call on you. Um, Maya, thank you. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> yes, I feel like I should have just done the same as everyone else now. I'm the odd one out. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so th this is so much. It's a great question and so much can be said about it. Um, it's, I didn't think I'd thought much about temporality in my work, but then I realized actually um, that in working on death, which is intrinsically about temporality, which I've been doing recently, I have. Um, so I'm going to be talk, talking about my more recent work on sort of secular ri rituals. And um, while it's not focused squarely on Christianity, it is agonistically related, related to Christianity because um, <clears throat> most of this work has been done in Britain, which is a kind of latently Christian sort of um, context. And I think, of course, it speaks to the webinar's theme because it does deal with temporality. Um, temporal imaginings are intrinsic to how we respond to death. And, and I think that's true no matter what culture we find ourselves in. Um, but I think in my new research, 
I've become intrigued by the mutating parameters of temporal imaginaries in relation to death, particularly around the notion of the afterlife. So um, I just want to sort of make a kind of quite a, a crass distinction here. And I, of course, we know in reality, everything's a lot more complex, but religious funerals, and here I have Catholic funerals or Christian funerals in the UK um, in mind, are, are often contrasted amongst the sort of general public with non-religious ones for for so sometimes lacking Maya, um you have cut off are you still there i'm still here can you hear me yeah we can hear you now yeah okay um sorry it's a really bad signal so religious funerals are often contrasted with non-religious ones for lacking in personalism um, the personal eulogy for in the Catholic funeral, for example, is often backgrounded to the universal um, and generalizing business of the mass, um, the purpose of which, of course, is to commend um, the faithful Christian soul um, to the mercy and love of God in the afterlife. So um, this. I think you've frozen again, Maya. Can you hear us? Are you still there? Hello? There we go. Am I back? Yes, you're back. Maybe I'll just turn my camera off um, to preserve bandwidth. So, um, so yes, the, the, the implicit assumption is that the deceased has not ended um, in time. They have merely departed or crossed over into a, a different time space known as eternity. Um, now, the fashion in the sort of secular West as this assumption is no longer central or tenable to many people is for funerals which do not place emphasis on notions of eternity, but those which remain strictly contained within the linear and imminent frame of the human lifespan. So whatever that person has achieved within the imminent frame of their life. Humanists, um, to give you the example, are, are sort of famously insist that the funeral um, is not a sort of commendation of the soul to any afterlife. It is um, simply a celebration of the one life that was. But even as humanist funerals are dramatically rising in popularity, the notion that time has ended completely for someone remains dis difficult for people to accept. And this is something I've been discovering in my research. So the idea that people must live on by jumping from one contained lifespan to another in the form of memory has, in a sense, taken over. Now, memory, of course, is important for people. Um, memories of departed people who we love are, are, are important, regardless or not whether you're religious um, or non-religious. But um, memory becomes almost, if you like, a new sort of death cult, I think, in, in many kind of secular uh, non-religious forms of, of talking about death and, and funerals. Um, and one of the things I've noticed in my research is a sort of a huge amount of anxiety about memory, because, of course, human memory is, is frail. So the, the problem becomes one of how to keep it fresh, how to keep the memory of the person fresh and alive. Um, and this is, of course, memories of the past. But people are also concerned, and this is I've noticed this particularly working with people who've lost children, um, about how to how to create new ones. So the idea is that memory is not something that relates to the past, but something that um, you need to continually make. And this is felt very strongly um, by parents who've lost children because the idea that the child's life is not, not continuing on is, is sort of like a complete travesty of, of the natural order. And, and so this, this concern to, to make new memories around the one who's departed um, is a big anxiety for people. And, and how do you do that when somebody is, is no longer alive? So people discuss anxiety about the memories they have of deceased family members fading. Um, and in this context, you know, material culture becomes ever so important as the retainer or trigger for the memory um, in this particular context. So toiletries, clothing, um, photographs, images. And my work with Miranda Hutton um, explores precisely this dynam dynamic, how material culture is curated in the home to ensure that memory does not fade. 
Now, in my other work on public health funerals, um, <clears throat> this question of time and the sort of the vacation of the afterlife, you know, what do you do when there isn't an afterlife to count on this other concept of time or, or continuity um, takes a different form. In the case of public health funerals, there's a, there's a tension between two default types of funeral that can, municipal council offers, um, officers can, can use, um, a religious one and a secular one. Now I'm talking the, the vast majority of public health funerals are um, not simply necessary or necessarily for people who um, <clears throat> cannot afford a funeral. Uh, an awful lot of them are for people for whom no one claims the body or no one um, is willing to assume any responsibility for the funeral at all. And often these are cases where family can't be found or, found, or they're estranged from family. Um, and even when people have the means, they want absolutely no part. They don't want to share information about that person for whatever reason, perhaps they've been abused by, by them. Um, and so they don't want to give any, contribute any details about that person's life to making that funeral, sort of that, that ritual happen. So they're very kind of put sort of strained, um, ethically difficult events for council officers to manage. Um, so there's two particular forms. They've traditionally always used um, religious ones, but they're increasingly moving to using secular celebrants. Um, now, the, the religious ones are in fact better suited to the public health context because they don't depend for their success on detailing the chronology of the deceased person's life. The eulogy doesn't have to take centre stage in the religious um, funeral. The secular funeral, however, is one that's absolutely fundamentally centred on the imminent frame of the life and, and nothing more than that. Um, the chronology of the deceased person's life is incredibly important for a secular non-religious funeral to really sort of be successful. It, it, it's got to contain details and anecdotes. It's got to almost bring that person back um, in, in those eulogies, in the words that are used. So um, the secular form is not well adapted to contexts where you know absolutely nothing about the person, um, except perhaps the date on which they were born and the date on which they died. And, Secular celebrants make an awful lot of this time span. This is all they have to work with, and they really work it. Um, and you get all kinds of very strange forms of um, funeral um, <clears throat> service in which um, made up lives are kind of recreated for these people. Um, and to return to the point about memory, you know, um, memory becomes this very important concept um, in, in, in relation to death. Um, regardless of religious or existential positionality, but as belief in the afterlife has receded, you know, human memory becomes charged to do a different kind of work. It comes to take on a more formal and elaborated role. Um, and, you know, the verb to remember has this kind of great el elocutionary force in secular funerals of this kind. Um, I've been to funerals where mourners are exhorted to repeatedly remember so and so the person and the life they probably lived in this decade when they were in their 20s and this decade when they were in their 30s and so on and so on until their death now these are of a peculiar funerals because often we're being ex whoever's there is being exhorted to remember someone who they never knew um at that and they're being exhorted to remember a life that perhaps didn't actually happen um, and quite often these ceremonies are being performed to um, <clears throat> in within in service spaces at chapels, funeral chapels at, in which there, there are no mourners present. Um, so there's not even anyone there to do the remembering. So it's in that that context, really, that um, that I'm interested in, you know, the temporality of death and, and about this question of, you know, well, what what happens? How do we mourn and what? What does memory mean um, when certain temporal horizons seem to be taken away from us, um, <clears throat> like are no longer there, can no longer be relied on? Um, how do we respond to that? That's me. OK, um, thank you so much. Destiny? Um, that definitely gives us a lot to think about. I'm going to turn to the chat now. We have two questions, it looks like. So our first question from Nicole is, 
Hi, Maya, I have a question. In this context, how do you analyze Catholic last rites? Does the time between last rites and the funeral become a distinct time or state of being in this context? Maya, you're muted. Yeah, um, I think strange things happen to time, um, particularly around death. Um, I think from a phenomenological perspective, if you're close to someone who, who's dying um, or has in, in the context of death and, and the sort of various hiatuses or liminal periods you, you go through, you're kind of forced through um, as a mourner between the moment of death itself and, you know, even the, the sort of the micro moments between um, there's so much you could say people are obsessed with the time the moment of actual death um with all kinds of things that happened around that time but also about the ab ab actual moment at which it happened you know sort of literally recording it um sort of 42 minutes past the hour or whatever um and and i think experientially or phenomenologically we experience time differently in a state of grief and in different phases of grief and i think that has been you know shown um, um quite quite well um by people who work in, on this i think so i think you know the catholic rites and, and the sort of funeral um the whole concept of a funeral or mortuary ritual um is 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 one way to manage that um so that the time between last rites and the funeral um it is a de would, it's definitely a distinct time um I, I think it, it's probably experienced differently. Um, there's a theology around that as well, you know, um, not, not a fixed one. Um, I mean, I think, you know, sort of Catholic ideas of pur purgatory are very interesting when we, when we want to, if we want to talk about, you know, ideas of Christian temporalities and, you know, what, what does purgatory mean? It's this kind of holding pen or waiting place, um, which actually, it's a very interesting idea because if if we if we assent to, to it, it's a it's a space in which we can continue a very much continue a relationship with the dead while they're in purgatory. So one of the things you do is you offer prayers for people in purgatory, and the people in purgatory will contact you, you know, in thought, sort of requesting those prayers. Um, the indulgences, famously, you know, which led to the Protestant Revolution, were were kind of uh, sought in order to get time off purgatory. So Christianity, like all religious forms, are it's shot through with really interesting <laughs> concepts of time and different temporalities. Um, so much that we could say, um, but I'll, I'll stop there. I don't want to ramble on. No, oh, thank you so no. much, Maya. I think Richard. I just want to yeah. chime in on last right stuff. Um, so one of the this was one of the sources of concern among priests and lay people in the um particularly in the first the first lockdown which had the most uh, stringent restrictions and so there was a lot of discussion about you know what wasn't was not possible um one thing which i was quite revealing in in that discussion was um, one of the monks saying well of course we can't give we can't give the, the dying person communion at the moment in the context of the pandemic as part of last rites and then he sort of thought about it and said of course a lot of the time we can't do that anyway because the people are you know beyond the beyond the capacity to be able to uh, to be able to to eat the body and blood of uh, of, of christ they're, they're, they're no longer you know they no longer have that function um they may no longer be be um be present in the way that they they can do that so there's kind of um there there is a, as as Amaya was saying this kind of strange there, there's a, an assumption about what the time which is occupied by the last rites is and the function which it plays um in including communion and confession and so on within it um but the 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 nature of time in the pandemic kind of i think brought into focus the fact that that in fact this idealized idea of time is 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 very rarely present in in catholicism um but you know that's something which in, in many respects you know the monks were very familiar with and very comfortable with i mean they when they're thinking about the cycle of prayer when they're thinking about the, the liturgy of the hours and praying the psalms um over and over again they're thinking about the fact that you know 
but they're doing this and they're picking up this chain of prayer which um begins before before they became monks which continues after um after they're dead that there's in a sense a kind of a so the way in which they're structuring their daily time implies within itself this kind of stretching out um into into this future this kind of infinite future um in ways which kind of has a a resonance with some of the the kind of vertiginous senses of time that that, that john describes in um in writing about uh, mormonism too but certainly this idea that the present is always implying these um th th these kinships into the past and future um yeah and that's definitely the case in in the last rights but um where you know that you know whether the soul is whatever the state of the soul um it's it's still present with us um there's a, yeah time time doesn't occupy this kind of linear space um sacramentally in, in, in catholicism thank you so much um i guess if um john and joel don't have anything to um, comment or elaborate on um we can move on to Diego's question. Um, I think Diego wants to know, um, is it the case that chronology and making memories to material culture is important? Um, because in secular funeral, the dead is in a sense really dead and can only exist in the memory of the living. Whereas in other funeral like rites, a certain type of um, autonomous um, existence is comp contemplated. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, I would say that memory is the, is the afterlife, is the new <laughs> Christian afterlife, if you like. Not that memory, personal memories of your beloved departed weren't also important, you know, before this kind of mass shift we've, we've seen sort of um, in the secular West towards kind of um, non-religion, um, but I think memory, the work of memory has changed um, and it is it's more important than ever um, because it, it is it's the afterlife. Now, this is where people reside after they die. This is how their time carries on. Hence the anxiety about the quality of memories we have. And this is very specific, I would say, to a kind of, you know, kind of, if you like, Western slash Christian culture. And, and, I, and I would want to link it to, um, you know, the sort of that temporality that Christianity uh, has culturally bequeathed us, the idea of the afterlife. Um, because there are plenty of places in the world in which, you know, your personal memories of people aren't, aren't as important. Um, there's just a lot less anxiety around the preservation of memory. Memory isn't, isn't a thing you have to work hard individually to preserve or to kind of create, curate materially. It's not something you have to kind of busy yourself with. It's, there are other, other ways of doing it. And there's even, you know, places in the world where um, mortuary practice is about forgetting. It's, it's about actively, it's the opposite of that, right? So... I think that there is a link there. I don't know, but it's still, um, <clears throat> you know, thinking in progress. Um, is it okay if I sort of like follow up on that a little bit? Yeah, go ahead, John. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, because um, I'm thinking about the importance of the material culture of memory. And I'm also thinking about this as being an issue of just also the site and the ontology of memory and also the kind of uh, pliability as you move memory from substrate to substrate, for lack of a better term. Uh, for instance, folks who are voluminous in their writing, they have a different kind of memory, right? They live on through their works is something that's once said. And I mention this because Memory is treated in a very interesting way, both transhumanism, Mormonism, and Mormon transhumanism, in as much as uh, Mormonism, even though it has a supernatural locale of memory because the person has all their memories and goes in the afterworld, and therefore, you know, one would think that the kind of religious aspect would be central. It has an intense investment in genealogy. 
they have the largest ge genealogical repository of information about human beings in the world locked up in a mountain that's designed to survive everything including a thermonuclear blast and as much as that there is an intense commitment by a religious organization to going and having a material form of memory that does not have to be kept up by psychic human labor um, and the other thing too is that there's something kind of moving about that both in um, Mormonism as much as this material material um, memory is meant to go and shift people's cosmological loci by allowing them to become baptized, allowing them to go and convert to the church, allowing them to um, perhaps even become gods in their afterlife, but also in uh, secular transhumanist ideation uh, where a lot of assumptions about how memory operates and how resurrection can occur are very linked. Uh, cryonics, that is the freezing of bodies, is very important, obviously. But one way that folks talk about cryonics is not just actually freezing the body so it can be thought again, right? They're realistic about the fact that there's incredible amounts of uh, damage to the body in the freezing process, no matter how good it is. And other forms of pseudo cryonics, such as glaciation, where you literally just entomb the body in glass. Um, there's no actual easy way to go and imagine that as resurrection, but they see that as sort of materializing the memory itself that's held in the brain. So the individual can be reproduced later on. And through computers or sort of a physical reproduction or something like that. So there's moments in which it kind of that the boundary between memory is something that's personal and psychic memory is something that's material and memory that's something that borders on the cosmological or in the case of Mormon transhumanism is cosmological because they imagine that they will in some ways make people literally gods through uh, the techniques that uh, secular transhumanists simply see themselves as making them more than human making them able to return that there's a lot of um, possibilities of continuity depending on how you frame things Okay, thank you, John. Uh, Joel, uh, you're muted. Thanks. Um, if you hadn't told me, you wouldn't even have to hear this. <laughs> um, I, uh, I, um, I, um, two quick thoughts. One very quick about what we're talking about. One is, um, I wonder if also the um, the emphasis on the materiality of memory in in secular funerals has to do with the kind of return of the person at death to material culture themselves um that's just a but the other thing that's interesting is you know the there's the old saw that funerals are for the living um there's a philosopher named samuel scheffler who wrote a book called death in the afterlife where he has a really interesting thought experiment um although it's a yeah, anyway, it, it, which goes like this. If you were told that when you died, your whole world died with you, everybody you knew died, everybody you cared about died, every institution you cared about crumbled, your whole world basically ended with you. Would you still be able to sustain a sense of a meaningful and in fact, an ethical life? And and he's, his answer, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't know that this is cross-culturally true, but his answer from the point of view of a kind of, you know, New York intellectual, which he is, um, is um, that no, it wouldn't. That we all depend on at least a secular notion of the afterlife, which is that the world continues after us and people continue after us and we live on in their memories and our, you know, our, our residues remain. And so I wonder if part of the work of the secular funerals is preserving that sense for ourselves and not just preserving our sense of connection to the person who died or the sort of continuity of our own smallest world, but our sense 
that the world is more than just our own life and that our the meaning of our own life is wrapped up in more than our secular span of time. Just a thought. Thank you, Joel. It looks like we have another question in the chat from Jen. It says, a question about time and boredom, perhaps also pertaining to the process of dying. Does the notion of waiting prove useful for elaborating any of your current thoughts? I'm particularly curious about the borders between desireless boredom and desireful waiting. Is that a useful border at all? Wait, um, just a sec. Maya, did you want to respond to Joel's comment or? Um, no, no, I'm I'm interested in Jen's question now, so <laughs> we can move on. OK. Um, yes, um, Richard. I can chime in a bit. Um, I mean, I suppose partly partly this relates to the whole question about the the content and structure of time, I suppose. Um, so this idea of this idea of waiting, and I mean, obviously, the the, the famous uh, the famous sort of expression of this is, is Samuel Beckett and waiting for Godot. But th this idea of waiting sort of presumes that there is something which is going to going to arrive. Um, that idea of something arriving is is pretty important in most forms of in most forms of, of Christianity. Um, in a transcendental way, we could say, you know, in terms of, you know, what, what transformation of the world um, in terms of um, in terms of waiting for something which is going to come after death, which we've been talking about, but also in a very basic, um, imminent way in terms of waiting for the year to, to, to process. So within Catholicism, and I think that this has become much harder to sustain within Catholicism in the context of urbanization and, and pluralistic society and so on, of course. But in the context of Catholicism, there is a liturgical cycle which anticipates um, this, this shift, this movement of time, which recognizes that time has different character at different points of the year, that there, you know, that there are moments of fasting and that there are moments of feasting, um, responds to the seasonality, um, responds to the seasonality seasonality of the year and, and, and all of these things. And the reason I'm kind of bringing this up um, is because I think once again, um, this has really been brought into relief by the nature of lockdown, because of course, initially this idea was, well, we're, we're waiting for this moment of release, you know, because if we, as long as we wait and we're in this state of lockdown, the, the pandemic will be over and we'll all sort of be able to emerge from our houses and, and, um, and hold hands once again. That sort of turned into this sort of state of a kind of a perpetual waiting, which um, for something which never seems to to manifest, this kind of Beckett esque um, waiting. And I think that that in a sense, this has been one of the real challenges. Um, I think one of the real um, one of the real challenges for um, religion in the time of lockdown. But then it it speaks to this wider sense of you know, time has been. Time has become motionless in this in this lockdown. But do, do we have any resources anymore to give to give time to give time the sense of motion? What makes any day what makes any day any different to the day that just went and the day which just comes? And as soon as you're into this sense, you're no longer in purposeful waiting. You're in a sense of of of, um, of existential boredom. You're in a sense of acedia and and potentially you know um, potentially depression there. So yeah. This lack of movement of time, it's 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 not good. Joel? Um just jumping in on Jen's question, which I, I like a lot. Um it, it also it has it struck me even before she posed the question that um we're talking about Christianity and ethics and time and uh Nobody, and this includes myself, has has brought up any anything about apocalypticism, millenarianism. Um, uh, certainly, in what I was calling disembedded ethics, at least in the place I worked in Papua New Guinea, um, there was a sense that you were living, you were waiting 
for that moment of ethical judgment. That's part of what I mean by disembedded. It's not going to get worked out on your human time scale, the ethical import of what you're doing. But any anyway, I just want so, 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 so there's sort of the, the boredom that that Richard's talking about, which may be that may be the desireless kind. And, you know, remember Durkheim called the enemy, you know, not knowing what to desire. That was his, it wasn't rulelessness, which is what it sort of became in low in later sociology. But his definition was just not knowing what to want and and a kind of desireful waiting where your ethical you you assume the ethical value of of your life will be revealed to you at at that later apoca apocalyptic time anyway just a thought it is interesting to me that we that we that 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 hadn't come up including in, in my own thinking uh, I mean, it's certainly one of the central problems of monasticism because monasticism, and we see this very clearly in the desert monks and the way that they think about life and they think about what they're anticipating and so on. It's very much a, a, an apocalyptic. They're, they're, they're living in apocalyptic times in, the, um, in what they're doing. And that's the characteristic of monasticism. But then monasticism has this problem that, you know, what, what do you do when the world doesn't seem, you know, when the world doesn't seem to be ending quite yet? Um, so you have to kick, there's a lot of kicking your heels before the world actually Absolutely. ends. Um, and in that time, you have to, you know, think about, well, okay, how are we going to make a living? How are we going to, you know, and so you get institutions and the institutions get property and the institution, you know, and all of these things, which then become, um, which sort of imminentize the whole, the whole of the, uh, apocalyptic project. Um, so it's a central it is a central problem that's there in in monasticism, I, I, I guess. Um, so so central, that I I didn't think I didn't think to mention it. <laughs> I guess. Maya. Yeah, I just uh, just following on really from Joel's previous question, but also jumping in quickly in relation to desireful waiting and boredom. Um, yeah, I mean I. On a personal note, one of the things that lockdown taught me, something I had never realised before, is the importance of things on the horizon. Um, I don't think I'd ever contemplated how much knowing that I was going to get to just jump on a train and go to London in a couple of weeks actually was, you know, how sustaining these things are. But actually, when you look at it and you, and you think about it, you, you realise actually um, that, that this is really fundamental these kind of forward looking you know our, our sense of horizon our sense of being able to look forward to something or this sense of waiting what kind of waiting we're doing but but waiting or expect or expectation is, is deeply connected with hope right um and and with life itself it's it's like a kind of compunction forward and you hear about people kind of who are uh, in a state of dying, hanging on for Christmas, right? And everyone dies in the new year. And this is kind of a well-known phenomenon um, that, you know, doctors talk about and, you know, palliative care professionals all, all know about this, this thing, you know, and sort of working with funeral directors, they always kind of roll their eyes when you talk about January um, and February. The, these are the months where everybody dies and people who weren't expected to make it somehow do um, meet these kind of landmarks. And so... So anyway, that that's an aside. But to just go back to, to Joel's really interesting point about, you know, this this idea of the secular afterlife, you know, um, Scheffler's concept that the, 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 the secular funeral does this work. I would completely agree with that. And it does, you know, humanist secular funerals are kind of replete with this kind of concept that life goes on. And this is really important, this message. Right. And it's sort of. Um, nature metaphors take over all of a sudden, you know, and it's all all a poem about the tree and <clears throat> its leaves falling off in the autumn and and this that and the other. So, so that kind of notion of the kind of um, anonymous or, or life in the in the in the universal sense continuing is a really strong message. Um, but I think what what I'm talking about in this you know, the 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 work memory has to do, has to do in continuing the life of the individual is actually something a little bit separate from that. People aren't content um, when they have lost a child with the notion alone that life goes on, right? Yeah, my life goes on as a mother or a father, or whatever, but I don't care. I don't even want to live if I've lost my child. You want that 
person to still be there. You want them to be having their afterlife, which is unique to them. Um, and so this is the kind of work that I'm talking about memory ends up having to do when there is no kind of cosmological or, or, or afterlife of the soul, you know, um, which in, in theory in Christianity we have, um, which can offer people at some level of comfort. Yeah, so I would I would make a distinction there between those different kinds of secular afterlife. Um, I think, yeah. Can I just say one more thing on waiting, um, which is that Joel has this very useful idea of, um, when he speaks about the Arachman living in parentheses. So I think I've, I've always found that a very useful concept for for thinking about um, millenarian expectations, but it's it is based on this idea of there being, as Maya was just said, something on the horizon. You know, you're living in parentheses, but with the expectation that there is something on the horizon. There's something qualitatively different with the situation of living in parentheses with this expectation of the future and living in parentheses where the future is is uh, unknown, uncertain, or may even just be a repetition of the of the present. And I think we sort of have to be attentive to those, you know, different qualities of waiting. Um, Living, living in parentheses where there's where there's nothing outside of those parentheses is a very diff different different um, different experience, which I think, um, yeah, which I think the lockdown has sort of brought brought into view both specifically, but also I think existentially because it makes people think, you know, well, what not just what am I waiting for in lockdown, but what am I waiting for at all. Hey, thank you so much, Richard. Um, I think um, we have another audience question um, from Valerio. Um, regarding time, do you see any tensions between Christianity and climate change, a technological acceleration, and artificial intelligence? For example, can changes in envi environments shape Christian time? Um, so um, um, I guess um, whoever wants to jump in, um, I think. Um, both John and Richard have research that are relevant here. We can start with John, I guess. Yeah, I was waiting for John. <laughs> I was waiting for Richard. Um, but I also had to go and think about that because when you say Christian time, uh, what sort of Christian time do you mean, right? Because what it meant for, say, like my vineyard believers and what it means for, say, uh, religious transhumanists is something different. I mean, one of the things that stands out is that a lot of this material for, how shall I say, uh, more conventionally Protestant and post-Protestant believers is this suggests like the other parentheses coming. You know what I mean? That uh, it suggests sort of uh, the imminence of the end. But what's interesting for religious transhumanists, I'm thinking not here only just of Mormon transhumanists, but also of Christian transhumanists. And there are some, they uh, tend to be less influential because they have a less coherent narrative about the relationship between technology and eschatology. But it means that change comes in gradations. That is, it's not a sharp disjunct between uh, this dispensation and the next, right? But that you ramp up and build and things like the advent of um, artificial intelligence or new technology is seen as a almost ontological transformation in the state of the the state of the world and perhaps even the state of the universe depending on how um, expansive the aspirations of the religious transhumanist is and it's interesting that there really isn't a kind of millennial edge to Mormon transhumanism, which is surprising because you don't have a sharp break between uh, 
the time of judgment and the time which on which one's judged, right? It's a continual transformation. And I think that, that the technology does, for those who don't view it as simply auguring the end, it does actually, it does still do work to sort of change the kind of qualitative nature of time as it builds up to a different state in which people will literally be post-human in as much as that they've transformed the state, nature and state of what humanity is. So the first thing I want to do is um, to name check um, Joseph Webster, who has an excellent paper on um, the idea of, of, of climate change and how it was received among the um, among the Scottish brethren. Um, who he was working with in Aberdeenshire um, and how they saw it as a, ultimately a, a false eschatology that, you know, it was this kind of of, of almost mocking parody of the true um, revelation of what's what's going to happen through time. Um, and and so, you know, the rejection then of the green agenda um, and in particular, I think in the form he described of burning videos of, of um, Al Gore and the inconvenient truth. Um, there's a rejection of this idea that it's demonic because what it's doing is that it's, it's taking things which belong to God, i.e. the idea of the apocalyptic, um, and, and turning them into this thing which we imagine that we as humans have, have a handle over. Um, so, you know, that he talks really about that um, incommensurability between between these ideas. But of course, as, as John says, you know, I mean, and this is a it's a cheap trick in, in anthropology of Christianity, but I guess we all do it, which is, you know, well, which which Christianity? Um, because, you know, ultimately, you know, I think you can look at that, but also you can look at, you know, um, Pope Francis and Laudato Si, and you can see within that, you know, a lot of these ideas of, you know, how the challenge of um, climate catastrophe is a fundamental um, a fundamental challenge to Christian hopes and expectations of time. You know, there's this very powerful moment in it where, where there's this, um, you know, because of us, thousands of species will never have the opportunity to give praise to God. What, what, what gave us that right? Um, and I think, you know, that's, so, so within, within that, there's this idea that time is being reconfigured by um but by the by the catastrophe of, of climate change but but even within catholicism and this this speaks very closely to to maya's work i think you know we have to be careful not to look at an encyclical of the pope and think aha that's catholicism um because you know the vast majority of catholics will never have read a papal encyclical let alone laudato si of course many um catholics in um particularly in america seem to think nothing of of um of 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 completely ridiculing and hating every word that the pope says um and imagining that they're they're still catholic so you know that's that's the nature of the church um so you know yeah i suppose we can say that there is you know that th th there is um a messy a messy incommensurability in in here um, around these around these ideas of of um, accelerations in time um, and whether time can really time as revealed can ever really be accelerated. Um, um, Thank you, John and Richard. Um, do we have any follow up thoughts from either Joel or Maya before we move on to the next question? All right, so it looks like our next question is from Phoebe and Phoebe's wondering to what extent ethical struggle is considered a communal activity within religious life. Do you have any thoughts on how communal spaces activities or interactions are structured in order to create codependent support or a sense of solidarity in the face of ethical struggle. Or contrastingly, to what extent did you observe ethical struggle to be considered an individual task. Um, yeah, I guess someone has to go and give people time to think of something actually coherent to say. So I'll uh, I'll vamp for a little bit. 
But one of the things that's interesting is that, of course, immortality in some ways is an ethical obligation for transhumanists, right? That if the telos of the universe is the creation of intelligence, and this is based on a kind of ontology where they see intelligence slowly unfolding over time to do things like, you know, biological life developing and then like human like symbolic intelligence and then machinic intelligence intelligence which they see will like outrun human intelligence but still you don't want to go and like get rid of intelligence that you have and it's a, it's a shame when someone dies because that's a repository of knowledge and capacity of like intelligence the past so you know staying alive is an ethical obligation but what's interesting is the gap between how that obligation is felt by secular transhumanists and how it's felt by uh, religious transhumanists and specifically Mormon transhumanists. One of the things that you see with secular transhumanists is this incredible anxiety about preventing their own personal death. It's something that falls entirely on their own shoulders. Uh, for instance, like Ray Kurzweil, he famously takes um, hundreds of supplements because he is trying to, Ray Kurzweil being a um, influential secular transhumanist who also has uh, an important role as sort of like, you know, uh, Google and a lot of other things like sec like, you know, a Singularity University, which is a, um, a para-educational transhumanist program, that he has an incredible pill regimen, right? to go and stretch his life so he can just get to the point where various forms of like, you know, machinic intelligence can help make him truly immortal, right? And obviously this is part of it because it's personally desirable, but also because, you know, again, uh, you have an ethical obligation to stay alive. And there's other transhumanists who are secular, I know, who one won't fly because a air crash, the brain is destroyed. There is no way to go and preserve information versus various form, other forms of death. This individual also reportedly wears a helmet a lot of the time when traveling to go and protect the vital information in the brain so he can be preserved <laughs> in case of death. And then you contrast that with sort of uh, Mormon transhumanists who don't seem to have that same kind of regimen. I mean, they do do things like, you know, take smart drugs and stuff like that, but it's not the kind of crushing obligation that it is. And the reason why is they feel that they can rely on their compatriots for resurrection, that because there are ways of having their memory preserved, um, do others and immortalize because they don't have to go and push themselves over past the goalposts. But if they fall short, they can rely upon their comrades going and making sure that there will be a sufficiently, um, how shall I say, authentic computer simulation of them that can, in effect, be them returned from the dead. That the same kind of anxieties about death are present. And so. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've kind of got to the point where I even forgot what the original question is. But there does seem to be a kind of aspect that a Christian collectivity can change anxieties about completing ethical obligations, even when uh, you don't have kind of a supernaturalized aspect as being standing at the fore of what's important in the question at hand. So, yeah, thank you, John. Thank you. Um, I think um, Joel, Joel had his hand up first. Um, then we'll go to Maya. OK, thanks. Yeah, I think this is a terrific question. And I think it's terrific um, for two reasons. One is that I think it actually gets at something that a lot of Christians themselves struggle with. Um, you know, what is the role of community in the ethical project? What is the role of of the individual? And I also think it's a terrific question because it invites um, pretty careful ethnographic specificity. So I, I just 
try to give a really quick answer for the people I've worked with in Papua New Guinea, the Arapmen, they, they talk a lot about what they call strengthening the belief of other people. That's what you do when you preach. That's what you do when you give moral exhortations, which people do a lot of the time. That's what you do when you pray with and for people. At the same time, they have a really strong sense that everybody is responsible individually for their own salvation and that all the strengthening of belief that is is uh, aimed toward you is isn't going to do anything it, it, if you don't um, if you don't um, live an ethical life yourself because for them salvation is really an ethical project so there is um, um, there is no sense of the kind of uh, that you can, that anybody can do it for you the sort of purgatory kind of model that Maya was talking about although they they have heard of purgatory and they do in fact call it in 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 the lingua franca of New Guinea, weight place, um, which my used. Anyway, I just think it, I think this is actually a, 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 a terrific question to build out from ethnography to theoretical concerns on because I think, and I know no, no feet Itsakus here has written about this a lot. I think it's something that is there. It's a question that's there in our material because it's there for the people we study and we might, you know, want to seize on it as a, as a as a as a kind of loose thread that the christian tradition has left for people to pull in different directions on, on to maya <laughs> thank you john and joel really fascinating um responses and these are such great questions as well you know um i mean i just wanted to offer two kind of opposing examples from um, my, my two bits of research, if you like, you know, in, in Brazil, which which suggests that, I mean, this idea of communal responses to ethics or, or individual ethics becoming communal responsibility. I mean, there's so many contexts in which you could read that happening. There was a very peculiar time um, in, in the history of Catholic theology um, liber when, lib when liberation theology was very big. Um, in South America, and particularly in, in the, the part of Brazil where I worked, there was a period of time in the, the 60s and 70s where um, confession was done communally. So individual confession was scrapped and people were invited to form a circle and everyone was to go around and confess their sins. So much like a kind of, you know, AA meeting kind of idea um, where you, you confess your individual um, sin and you are collectively absolved um but there's a kind of so the idea is that that i suppose there was a movement at that time to try and reinterpret individual sins as structural problems um and of course i wasn't doing research um in the field at that time so i don't have any first hand but i just think it's a really interesting example of, of a sort of experiment in in turning something that has traditionally and typically in Christianity been a, quite an individual thing is the idea of confession it's working on the self um, into something very communal and it didn't last that's the important thing it's it's gone it went pretty quickly back to being you know an individual thing um, in my work on death something that I find is a little bit interesting it's, it's interesting and irksome at the same time is, is some of the kind of activism and messages you get um, coming out of the death positive movement which is a kind of movement which you know made up of activists and palliative care professionals and funeral professionals who are all about you know this kind of a uh, very romanticized idea of you know how, how to have a good death and to reclaim um death like like birth was um again you know in the 70s and 80s you know the sort of natural birth movement there is in a sense a natural death movement and which exists today in which a massive emphasis is being put on um individual responsibility for the good death right death is something that we um has been taken out of our hands for too long um it's all in the hands of these professionals who don't know us um for too long we've been dying in hospitals not at home surrounded by our nearest and dearest so it's kind of romantic notion of what, what a good death is you know um is being held up as something that we must strive for and we must put plans in place in advance of our death in order to ensure that you know should we um be graced with the kind of 
death which is not perhaps you know sudden and unexpected but a but the death that comes out of an illness where we are sentient and conscious sort of almost up to the end and can communicate our wishes you know that this is the ideal good death um but in case we don't have that we should have written things down we should have planned it uh, we should have planned pre-planned our funeral prepaid it if possible we should um <clears throat> engage with all kinds of apps and websites and and log our our wishes and our desires for our our funerals and, and how we are to be remembered so this is all sort of being um seen as the responsibility of the individual um this idea that that death is something that you know perhaps should be <laughs> Perhaps this is the one context in our life where we really are truly dependent on others. It is truly communal, right? Um, in the sense that, particularly, you know, in the process of dying and then after death, you know, we can no longer enact that kind of individual ethical agency. So we are entirely dependent on the, the, the eth ethical agency of the group. Um, it seems to me a little bit pernicious, but that that responsibility is being um put back on individuals um but you know there's there's different ways people think differently about it and you know in the same way that um there was a movement to kind of um take ownership of birth and for women pregnant women to make birth plans in order to have these perfect births right where their agency is you know sort of fully present and they have thought ethically about what what would be right for their family members and right for them and you know um, everything has been planned to the to a t right down to the music you want playing as you're having your water birth in your lovely living room you know surrounded by plants and your doula and all of that and of course um birth like death is something in which you know your best played best laid plans go to go to waste so it seems to me kind of you know i don't know i just i i find that yeah um that movement away from the communal back to the individual in those in those contexts where we are so vulnerable um and, and where we kind of need the group right um these these shouldn't be moments necessarily in which it is all up to us um not to say that our agency and our voice isn't important of course it is but the way it gets framed in in discourse i think can be um yeah a bit a bit sort of difficult if that makes any sense sorry <laughs> No, it definitely does. Um, thank you so much, Maya. Um, Richard. You are muted, Richard. OK, I clicked it. I was impatient and I clicked it again and it muted myself again. You'd think that studying with monks, you'd learn some patience, but it, it doesn't it doesn't work like that. Um, so, yeah, this whole this question of um, individual or communal ethical struggle it's a really important one in monastic history and in particular um get rid of that cat you're stealing the show with your cat john this is <laughs> this question of individual communal struggle it's kind of an important one in monastic history but also um in kind of i suppose what you call a folk history of monks the way that they tell stories about their own history um so these desert monks that i was talking about i mean, I mean, one of the reasons why they suffer from acedia is because they're going it alone, right? They're out there, they're in their cells, they're in the desert, and on their own, they, they don't have the resources to deal with the fact that, you know, that, that they're experiencing this, this sense of, of boredom and despondency. And so one of the developments that comes out of this is, is communal living. It's the idea that monks, through the social, through the support of, um, of a society of like-minded individuals um, can get through these struggles and not give in to the temptation because remember this is a temp this is a demon that's going to assail you and you'll give in to it you'll just be like what's what's the point in this i'm going back to the city where you know there are lots of prostitutes true story it has seemed to happen with a lot of monks um, so in this context it's like how, how do we get through this well having a society of like-minded people um, does this now so this is the reason why the rule of St. Benedict, further along in the history of monasticism, begins with um, talking about the worst kinds of monks. So it, it literally goes through different types of monks. And it's like, these guys are these guys are the worst, except for these other guys who are who are even more the worst. Um, and so it, it talks about 
studies amongst like gyral vagues, um, gyral vagues, sort of one different place to place, and they're like, oh, I'm, I'm here now, and I'll go and be a monk somewhere else another time. No, they are the worst. You just need to settle down. You need to stick with stick with your 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 community, and that's in that social setting. It's in that social setting of learning to care for one another and learning to have responsibility for one another that you have the discipline that you need for, to to live a moral life and to not um, be subject to these um, to these forms of, of sin and, and attack. So it's, it's a really important part of this history, moving away from individual monasticism to communal monasticism in, in, in the Western tradition anyway. But at the same time, there's always but in anthropology, but at the same time, one of the things that's so striking in, um, in, mona in English Benedictine monasticism and in a lot of monastic traditions is that although this communal living is so important, at the very heart of it is an idea of mysticism, an idea of contemplative personal prayer in which the monk is, is uh, solus cum solo, is alone with the alone. And it alone with, you know, God is conceived of being this thing which is which stands alone. And the monk is conceived of being this thing who needs the solitude in order to be alone with the alone. And indeed, you know, in this state of mysticism, you know, there's nothing that can be communicated, nothing that can be done in terms of, of shaping the expectations of this. Um, and so in, in that, you know, that, that kind of heart of, of the monastic experience is deeply individualistic. In, in that sense. Um, and so there and, and in many respects, there is this tension between the, the deeply individualistic current um, in monasticism and the fact that, you know, you have to get on with all of these other people um, and live with them until you die, um, which, you know, which is a struggle for many monks. Um, it genuinely is. And they'll, they'd say the same themselves. OK, thank you so much, um, all. Um, uh... I think we'll move on to um, Connie's question. Um, um, I would like to know whether the location and or definition of soul in religious context, um, and she notes particularly um, in terms of Mormonism, um, might link into this embedded or embedded notions of ethics. Do Mormons see the brain or mind as a seat for the soul, or is it memory, or are they interlinked? And if this is the case, surely the soul is therefore not separate from the body. I think um, since talk on Mormonism, maybe John. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. I was reading along with the question because I want to make sure I got the import because it's such a good question. Um, one of the things that's interesting about Mormonism, and I'm just talking about it. Uh, and it's kind of um, default mode and not any kind of like particular like transhumanist instantiation is that it's a, a post Newtonian post Copernican religion. Uh, for instance, it's very comfortable with the idea that there are uh, endless worlds that are also peopled with human beings that are children of God. And uh, that means also that there's an amazing uh, Mormon science fiction community and also a lot of strange Mormon discussions about UFOs. But um, the post-Newtonian aspect is just as important, right? Because it's about the materiality of things. And um, one of the things that's, one of the many things that sets uh, Mormonism aside from other modes of religiosity is it's really not up with this X-9. Uh, you cannot just create nothing out of nothing. Everything pre-exists. And um, even humans pre-exist. They exist, pre-exist uh, their birth in the raw form of intelligence, which is just sort of a generic attribute of the universe and is obviously connected in Mormon transhumanism to the ideas about intelligence and teleology and the universe's purpose and goal. Um, but through various forms that are addressed with different degrees of specificity, um, Heavenly Mother and Heavenly Father go and take that raw form of intelligence and create spirits. And spirits or souls are material, even in their pre-existence. 
and spirit and soul has a material instantiation. It's a more refined form of matter, but it is matter all the same. And one of the things that's interesting about conventional uh, Mormon accounts of the day of the resurrection is that one of the things that will happen is the blood, the body will be re, you know, like rebuilt through divine fiat and the blood will be removed and or quickened or transformed into spirit, which is this kind of silver like matter, which means that it's really hard to go and talk about the body and the soul and memory as separate organs. So what happens when you die is a large aspect of the spirit and soul are taken out and um, put into the spirit world. But the idea is that it's sort of a material transformation, an actual physical change of locale. So um, that means there's not really an easy and fast separation between sort of spirit, soul, and body. It's just various sort of uh, different instantiations. I should also like to add that this is something you can see in um, other forms of Christianity. For instance, there is an intellectual movement among some uh, Protestant theologians to basically get rid of the idea of the soul and to basically say that embodiment is what matters and what happens on day when you die is not that your soul goes off and then it will be returned to a body but that you're you're dead and you will be physically rebuilt on the day of the resurrection that there is nothing that soul other than some kind of metaphoric way of talking about some aspect or quality of the body but again this is a small limited intellectual movement but um i think it also has some kind of analogs in Christian history that precede it. Anyhow, thank you for the question. Thank you, John. Um, Richard. Yeah, I just I wanted to flag up. This is a really interesting question because one of the things which I find interesting, you know, I started off with ethnography of monks and now I'm sort of going into these um, early sources it's one of the things I find interesting and challenging about looking at those early sources is how much they can be counterintuitive to expectations, theological expectations that we have of what, you know, what Christianity looks like. And in particular, some of this baked in dualisms that we've been talking about here in terms of imminence transcendence, you know, um, in, and, and in terms of, I think, soul body is kind of a, a manifestation of that. So particularly if you read Evagrius Podgus, um, I think that the word which I would use to describe is, is, is it's a deeply materialist account. It's a deeply materialist account in a number of senses. Remember I talked about the idea of, of this, the demon of acedia. This is a thing which which assails you. It's not, it, you know, it's not metaphysicalized in some sense of, you know, oh, there's this, you know, this this floaty concept which might you know get you in the head it's, it's a thing which is going to assail you and the symptoms of that assailment are, are physical symptoms the physical symptoms which are, which we would associate today with um very of, of of depression and so on so this idea this idea that we can think of it in terms of kind of um yeah as i said this isn't a metaphysicalized idea and that's why manual labor comes in here as one of the remedies for this because one of the problems of acedia, of this lack of care, is that we we decenter ourselves from this body, that we think that this body isn't something that matters. Whereas recentering ourselves through graft, through physical labor, is a way of reminding ourselves, you know, of what of of, of your you know of your presence and and place in the world. Um, and that was seen as something important. So I think these sort of material materialist countercurrents. This is, I mean, this is a materialism, a materialism which includes God, which includes in eternity, you know, where it's it's a materialism in that sense, but it's an um it's one that sort of flies in the face of this idea that the important things which the which the monk is aiming for here are um somehow transcendent things which are apart from um the material world. You're going to the desert to concentrate on on this on, on this material world and win the battle within it rather than going somehow to kind of um, escape it. 
if that makes sense. If I can just follow up, I don't know why uh, what Richard said brought my mind to this, but uh, one of the things that's interesting is uh, about 19th century Mormonism is that polygamy was, yes, something that one had to do to go and ascend to godhood, right? That you had to go and have a patriarchal family, uh, presumably, but there was also like an openness about the, the pleasure of polygamy in a way that was, mm, well, still like ethical at its core, right? But they were, they were comfortable with the idea that there are pleasures of the flesh. And I think it has to do with the materiality, right? Because if you're not going to go and have that sharp of a division between soul and body, then that no longer opens up the possibility that the body and its pleasures is something that has to be controlled, shut down, contained, rather sort of used ethically and wisely instead. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, but now Mormons are really pent up about this stuff. I should just add this. <laughs> 21st century Mormons are pretty pent up about this. OK, um, we'd just like to ask um, we have like one last audience question. Um, um, I, I'm really wary of the time, like we have around two or three minutes, but um, um, are you all willing to um, entertain the last question? And then um, we can wrap it up after that. OK, thank you so much. Um, so, um, Nicole, um, um, wrapping up um, as a uh, last question um, from um, from them, um, is there a difference between collective and individual time in life and the afterlife? And this is um, brings us back to our central question, but it's also a really um, broad question as well. Um, so um, I guess um, whoever wants to begin with that. I can go first because it's going to be really easy. There is no individual time in the afterlife for the population I'm talking about. There just isn't. The closest thing you have is sort of like, you know, uh, if you're cast out into utter darkness, which is if you basically Mormonism is a kind of universalism and everyone gets some kind of positive salvation unless uh, you're an apostate, in which case you are flung out by yourself into darkness with no connection to anyone. So the only vision they have of any kind of individual existence in the afterlife is the closest thing they have to a permanent hell as opposed to sort of spirit jail which is hell-like but is temporary and is quasi-purgatorial except for the fact that no one can really help you while you're there you just have to do time served maya yeah just quickly um Taking this back to memory, I mean, you know, anthropologists have written extensively about collective memory versus in, in, individual memory, personal memory, and, and these are very different things and, and things that we work at in different ways. And in relation to my research on um, memory and, and death, um, I would say that the, after, the, the afterlife that memory has become is, is intrinsically um, co collective, and, and this is what people are striving to do in their, their curation of the material um afterlife of the person who who no longer has a, a sort of christian soul afterlife with god their afterlife exists in the curation of their material possessions left behind um, and the memories of those who are left behind but the the act of curating the materiality of those objects is displaying them around the house you know this is this is a form of mourning which has to be legible by everyone okay this is how you make the, the person live I would say that I don't want to draw a hard decision. It's not that people don't also have their private memories. And I think that the, there is a distinction that scholars make between its concept of grief and mourning, right? Mourning being the more collective expression of a memory um, or collective notion of time, if you like, in relation to, to lives and afterlives and grief being the more personal um, sort of phenomenological experience. So I, I, I would sort of maintain that distinction, but I would say in the work I've been doing, um, 
for memory to become afterlife, it, it, it has to be collectivized. It has to be legible by everyone, not just the person themselves. Thank you, Maya. Joel? Just a, a quick, quick thought. Um, I, um, well, I think I'll, uh, this may be true of a lot of religions, maybe all sort of non-mystical aspects of religion or all non-mystical expressions of religion do have to do a lot of work to get people together in time. You know, think about all the bells and the calls to prayer and, the, you know, creating collective time. Now, that may just be a, a social problem in general, a problem for all of social life, but religion's really foregrounded. And I think that really does make this a, a really interesting question about whether part of the perfection of the afterlife, to go back to, you know, where I started with these sort of transcendence positing um, religions is that people will just be together in time uh, is a really interesting question. I, I I have worked with people generally who don't elaborate visions of the afterlife very, um, very fully. Um, I, I know sort of from John that the Mormons, for example, do. So I, I don't I can't answer the question with a lot of ethnographic um, specificity, but I, I do think it is interesting to think about how much work is put into making collective time religiously and how much of even when you just think about the frustrations people have with how many people come to church and things like that religious leaders have getting people together in time is is a huge um religious religious task um and one around which a lot of ethical concern um can can get uh, get expressed thanks Thank you, Joel. Richard? Yeah, it's like, um, like got Turner, um, Image and Pilgrimage and Catholic Culture off the shelf. It's the benefit of being in the office is that I have my books. Um, but the, the Turner and Turner, um, they, they, they put it quite well in the context of, of Catholicism um, in that they, they say the doctrine of the communion of saints presupposes that souls may help one another and they, they break it down the whole idea of this that the triune church that you have the the um the church triumphant who are the you know the saints in heaven um but that you have you know the church militant who are all of these you know us the living mortals um who are, who are besieged by all of these by, by by all of these demons um and also you have the church suffering of these souls in purgatory and the idea I think of liturgical time and why liturgical time is so central within um, within Catholic ideas of Christianity is precisely that it, it brings into um, it brings into coordination these different elements of the church because um, liturgical time as this repeating mode um, and this is a very important thing to the monks this idea that you know we're praying these words which have being prayed through time and we're picking up that we're picking up that thread um, and we're sharing it with with past and future um, it it brings it it sort of brings a consciousness about of this imagined community of this um communitas to be very directly turnarian about it which is which is not just a communality the communality that we have here on earth among ourselves at its best is meant to also imagine this communality which which stretches through time um, which presupposes that, um, that that we can pray on one another's behalf and that time is not is not inherently an obstacle to that um, and I think that this is sort of so this is a very important thing at the heart of um, liturgical of, of liturgical Catholicism um, one of the sort of the of course of course, within Protestant forms of Catholicism, it's precise, some of these ideas have precisely come under attack. The idea of uh, purgatory and as, 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 a, as a space that, that one can act upon. Um, can we do anything about, about, those, um, about those who are in this, this waiting room? Um, the, the, the idea of, of liturgy as being, something, um, as being something active rather than something which is... Uh, <laughs> 
uh, the, the idea of liturgy being ritual in other sense that it can be something efficacious as opposed to something which purely acts on an ethical personal level um, these are things which in, in many respects um, in the history of Protestantism has, has kind of um, sought to problematize but at the same time they're deeply persistent ideas within Protestantism there's no there, there, there is no Protestant church which does not have these ritual elements. There is no, you know, the idea, the idea of, of, of relationships with the dead. Um, I think, you know, and I think Joel's work, I think also um, I think uh, who am I thinking of here. But I mean, a lot of work on, you know, deals with this problem of how do you maintain relationships with the dead in the absence of a kind of a ritual form that can that can make that possible. Piers Vitebsky um, on conversion on conversion um, to Christianity in India, I think, puts this very poignantly. How can we speak to the dead? That sense of of, of loss there, but a sense of loss is still a sort of a continuing relationship there. Um, so I think that to answer the question, the coordination of collective time in a way which imagines that there's a collective time which is both here in in the present world and also can involve um can involve past and future can involve people who are not living is it's a central problem of christianity um and you know while it's a problem which you know in, in this sort of very the turners can be very triumphalist about their catholicism sometimes and they sort of but look Trumpet like, hey, Catholicism solved this problem. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. But I mean, it's. I think the more general problem thing is to say, you know, this is a central concern within Christianity. How can we do it? What are the limits of being able to do it? Um, and I think, you know, yeah. And this is what I think the, the people that John's working with are really, you know, pushing the envelope in terms of just how just how you can do this, um, making, you know. How can you make a collectivity um, through time? Thank you, Richard. Um, at this point, I wanted to say a massive thank you to our four panelists. It's been wonderful to hear all of your ideas and definitely given me a lot to think about. Um, so now we just have a few moments. If you have any closing thoughts or anything you want to share with the group, um, I will turn it back over to you and then we will say farewell for today. So maybe thank if you. we. Thank you oh. to you guys for organizing it. Um, it's been great. And thanks, yeah. thanks, my angel and, and Paul and John for, for all coming. It's, you know, it's been, been brilliant having you. And it's a shame we can't have you properly in St. Andrews, but then again, we probably wouldn't have been able to have all three of you at the one point in St. Andrews. So, you know. Yeah, I'd just like to thank everybody for their time and for this collectivity. <laughs> <laughs> we have managed to be together in time here, having such an interesting conversation. Thank you. And, and I also wanted yeah. to. I, I wanted to. Uh, I, I I also wanted to say thanks for the organizing the event and the invitation. But also, uh, when we signed up, there wasn't fully a topic. So I also want to thank you for finding such a perfect kind of Venn diagram overlap point between all our interests. When I saw the um, when when I saw the topic, finally, I, I, I was so glad I had agreed to come because this is uh, this is something. Anyway, I, I thought it was a, a stroke of genius to find this place where we, you know, our roads all cross. So Thank, thanks very much to the organizers for for uh, putting the time in to, to to make such a fruitful topic for this group to, to take to take on. John. Oh, thank you. Uh, and speaking of thank you, I just want to go and um, follow up on everyone else, uh, expressing my gratitude for the creation of this uh, ethical collectivity, which will have an afterlife, I understand, in the form of a recording. But uh, I really enjoy these kind of moments. This is what makes this high work, low pay job worth doing. <laughs> so this is this is the cream. This is the cream. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, and yeah, um, we're glad that you enjoyed the central question and um, enjoyed the conversation at hand. Um, Thank you um, to our audience as well for asking great questions and um, for 
coming to the event. Um, um, we understand it's um, late in the UK and then early um, in the States and um, wherever you are tuning in. Um, we're very grateful um, to have a very international audience as well. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, um, if you um, want to review the um, webinar, it will be up on our channel um, shortly. And um, thank you, everybody, and we'll say farewell and end the recording as well. Thank you so much.